Hello, everybody out there, and welcome to this Halloween edition of Tasting Together. Uh, my name is Pat Fahey. I'm a Master Cicerone and Content Director for the Cicerone Certification Program, and we're going to be talking about pumpkin beer this week. Um, I do have to apologize. I It's been a busy week. I was hoping that I could like be playing spooky music or like wearing a pumpkin on my head while I did this session, but I just did not have time to get any of those uh, any of those pieces together so uh, you'll have to just go with regular old me and, and pumpkin beer um, as I say at the outset of every one of these tasting together what our goal is to do is to offer sort of a light-hearted look at a, some topic from the canon of general beer topics oftentimes we're covering a beer style hopefully doing it with a beer in hand because you'll definitely have a better time listening to me talk if you're having a beer while we do it um, if you've been here before, or if you're coming back, uh, last week Neil did American Lager, and I we got feedback from a number of people that they weren't necessarily super excited about the session, but learned a lot about the style and kind of like saw it in a different light after after that talk. So if you didn't see that one, I'd encourage you to go check it out. It is a it is a style that is often kind of looked down upon but there are a lot of there's a lot to say about it there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, about that style so definitely worth checking that out um, if this is your first time here one thing I always like to say up front is make sure if you have any questions as we're going that you just throw them out in the chat I won't necessarily get to them right when they come through but uh, I try to make sure that I get to everyone's questions before the end of the session so if you have questions throw them out um, as long as they're even somewhat related to what we're talking about, I'll, I'll do what I can to, uh, to answer them and, and help you, help you get a better feel for whatever it is that you want to know more about. So, uh, wanted to take this moment to, uh, address the schedule for the coming weeks. And first of all, I have some some sad news, and that is that we are going to be winding down the weekly tasting togethers after the month of November. Um, we've been doing a lot of work recently on some projects to develop more e-learning resources and classes, um, and that is eating up a, a lot of our time. And so uh, I it, it brings me great sadness, and we may, you know, toy with returning to this format on a less frequent than weekly basis at some point in the future. But uh, we're going to be doing three more weeks of this after today, and then we're going to wind it down for the time being. So I know this, the, seeing these comments is just like breaking my, my heart. Y you can still drink beer on Wednesdays without me, I promise. I, hopefully, hopefully you've, I, I have faith in you all. Um, so for those next three weeks, uh, next week, Neil is going to be back in doing California Common. Um, the following week, I am going to be doing Fruit Lambic, which should be a lot of fun. And then for that last session, which is November 18th, um, we figured we'd kind of go out with a bang and, and do something kind of fun. So what I wanted to do was just talk generally about aged beer and, uh, you know, everybody out there, just like pull something fun or special from your cellar to, to drink for that session. If you are a person who does not have a cellar, I commend you on not keeping beer until it gets too old and just dies in a closet somewhere in your house. Um, just pick up something that you've been eyeing and that you'd, that you'd like to drink, even, even if it doesn't have age character to it, uh, you know, I just kind of want that last week to be like fun celebration, drink some beer that you've been been holding on to or saving for something. It should be a, a fun one for all of us. So um, I, I have not made my selection yet, but I'm going to plumb the cellar and try to find a couple, a couple treats that'll be worth enjoying during that session. So without further ado, uh, let's dig into pumpkin beer. I think it's kind of funny that we went like American lager, which like I said, is a style that is often looked down upon and 
has does have a lot of interesting stuff you can say about it. Um, pumpkin beer is also gets a lot of hate, I think. And uh, there's it, it is less pedigreed than American lager for sure. But in doing some prep for this talk, I definitely did learn some interesting things that hopefully you guys will find interesting as well. Um, I do want to apologize on the timing for this session. I hadn't bought a pumpkin beer in like a decade. So I forgot about like how much of a thing seasonal creep is and how like if you want to buy pumpkin beer, you should be doing it in like July and August. Uh, I worked really hard to find pumpkin beer, like went to three different places. And the best I could come up with was uh, some Jolly Pumpkin. And then I had a can of Libby's pumpkin. And I figured just like, you know, doing the best I can over here. Um, I did actually, I was actually able to find a pumpkin ish beer of sorts. Um, I did go to three different beer stores and at, uh, the Benny's in their mixed six pack area, they had literally one bottle of sweet potato ale from Bent River Brewing here in Illinois. Um, and it is spiced with pumpkin spices. So I was like, that'll do. I'll make that work. Uh, so that's the beer that I am drinking today. So cheers to all of you out there. I've been seeing from like other people, all like people posting all of these more widely available pumpkin brands that I'm familiar with. So I'm glad that other people, like as I was shopping for this, I was like, crap, like no one is going to be able to actually get the beer for this week. Uh, but I, I'm glad that people were able to find some. Um, there are still a number of brands of this style being produced. Uh, but like I said, when I talked to the people at Benny's, they're like, oh yeah, we sold out of our last thing of pumpkin beer in like mid-September. So. so yeah, it is what it is. Uh, when it comes to glassware for pumpkin beer, definitely not a traditional glass associated with the style. If anything, since it is very much like an American style, you probably most often see them in American shaker pints. When it comes down to something like that, I'm going to, I'm going to drink it out of a tulip. So, so let's talk a little bit about pumpkin beer history and one of the things that I wanted to, you know, start by saying, and and some of this may be news to some of you, some of you may already know this quite well, but when we talk about pumpkin things, whether it's pumpkin beer or just pumpkin flavored things, it's not really about pumpkin in in most cases today, and and in a lot of cases, uh, those items may not even have any pumpkin in them. What it's really about is pumpkin pie spice. Um, you know, this mixture of this traditional blend of spices that gets used to flavor a number of different fall things. Um, the spices included are usually cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, allspice, um, sometimes cloves. So those kind of make up the core of the pumpkin pie spice blend. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about pumpkin pie spice generally and like how that sort of in, infiltrated the public consciousness. You know, those spices have been used in cooking for a very long time, but, and we don't know necessarily exactly when people started using them sort of focused in like pumpkin or squash like dishes. But from what I was able to dig up, the first references we see to like pumpkin pie spice showed up in writing in the 1930s. Um, and by the 1950s or so, spice brands like McCormick's were, were selling a pumpkin pie spice. Eventually they dropped the pie and it just became known as pumpkin spice. Um, today, you know, fall generally is like pumpkin spice or pumpkin pie spice season. And a lot of that is really driven by the emergence of the pumpkin spice latte. Um, there were other pumpkin spiced products prior to that. And, you know, Starbucks, who's very well known for the pumpkin spice latte, 
was not the first company to even introduce that beverage. From what I saw, uh, what I, from what I was able to dig up, people were mixing pumpkin spice with coffee in the mid 90s. But Starbucks releasing the pumpkin spice latte nationwide in 2004 is what led to like our current day every fall is just like pumpkin spice season. And I, I, I think too that that widespread availability of it is what has led people to, some people to very much love it and some people to very much hate it just because of how ubiquitous it is today. Um, but pumpkin beers predate that somewhat significantly. Um, you know, if you wanna talk about pumpkin beer generally, Pumpkin beer as, as like an American invention can be traced back to the 1700s as a kind of a, an invention of necessity by English colonists here in the States in, in the 1700s. So at the time, um, you know, one of the things that, one of the things about pumpkin is pumpkin is a squash. It's a very starchy vegetable. Uh, it can provide a lot of fermentable sugar to make an alcoholic product. So in that time period when wild pumpkins were somewhat abundant and uh, cultivated grain less so, colonists were using pumpkins to make sort of a, either a, you could consider it a pumpkin beer or in some cases, at least in those early days, it was just pumpkin as a fermentable. So technically it would be more like a pumpkin wine. Um, could have been spiced with stuff, but didn't necessarily have to be. Uh, I have no idea what those would have tasted like. They probably would have been pretty terrible if I'm, if I'm being totally honest. But uh, so that's kind of like the first iteration of pumpkin beer. That died out over the course of the 1800s. Uh, not 100% clear why, but if, if I had to guess, probably has to do with the fact that as agriculture became better established here and grain became more readily available, you know, brewers would have been using grain to make beer rather than using pumpkin as a fermentable source. Um, similarly, a lot of the brewing trends of the mid to late 1800s were driven by German immigrants. And so those German immigrants, very skilled in making malt-based beers, probably wouldn't have been like, hey, let's also try to experiment with this weird gourd that grows naturally here. So pumpkin beer died out as a, as a product and really only came back into being in the 1980s. I saw somebody, I think actually the first person that posted what they were drinking was drinking a Buffalo Bills pumpkin beer. Buffalo Bills Brewery out in California is supposedly the first brewery uh, to, or the first commercial brewery to make a pumpkin beer. And the story goes that uh, Bill Owens, guy behind Buffalo Bills, found a recipe in George Washington's writings that talked about this pumpkin beer. And he like got really excited about it. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of brewing, uh, craft brewing in that time, in that period in like the eight, 80s, Brewers were looking for inspiration wherever they could find it. You know, a lot of the styles that we have today are American reinterpretations of styles from other places. So it kind of makes sense that um, a craft brewer at the time would have been looking like, uh, let's see what cool American historical traditions exist. So we found this recipe that was for a pumpkin beer. He like went all in, he like grew his own pumpkins to make this beer. And he brewed the beer, he added the pumpkin and was like, the pumpkin didn't add anything. He was like, it literally didn't provide anything to the beer. And so to try to make it something a little bit more special, he added pumpkin pie spices in to, uh, you know, give it flavor in line with what I think a lot of people would think of as like a pumpkin flavored thing. A lot of people, when they think about pumpkin flavor, they're thinking about those pumpkin pie spices. So he released that beer in 1986 and uh, a number of other brewers followed suit, um, brewing these sort of pumpkin beers that were really driven by pumpkin pie spice flavor. Uh, pumpkin is really a secondary component 
in, in those beers. And some beers that are labeled as pumpkin beers aren't even, are, are not made with pumpkin because once again, the pumpkin does not provide very much in the way of flavor. It's the pumpkin spices or those group of spices that we refer to as pumpkin spices that drive most of what people expect out of pumpkin flavored products. So while well, the style is somewhat maligned today and a lot of people like to hate on, on pumpkin beer, and it is not nearly as popular as it once was, I think it's worth remembering that even just a decade ago, when you looked at like the craft category of beer, one of the biggest types of, of beers sold out of the craft category was seasonal beers. And a lot of those seasonal beer sales were driven by fall pumpkin beers. So pumpkin beer used to be a pretty impactful and influential category within the craft sphere. And I wanna say it's really only been within the last five years, five or six years that we've seen a pretty significant decline in the popularity of those beers. Um, and I'm not 100% sure what has driven that. It, potentially, it, it could be in part like with pumpkin flavored stuff just being everywhere at this time of year that people just got kind of sick of it. It could be that people drinking craft beers have warmed up more to other styles like IPAs and, and things that have more like beer flavors rather than just these spice flavors. It could be that, you know, at this point, there's so much like pastry stout and heavily adjuncted beer on the market year round that uh, the need for a seasonal pumpkin spice fix just doesn't exist anymore. Not exactly sure. Uh, like I said, there are still a number of pumpkin beer brands on the market that are very successful. Uh, it just is not nearly as popular as it was just a decade ago. So, and that's everything I learned about the history of, of pumpkin beer. <laughs> so hopefully that somebody out there was like, ah, oh, that is kind of interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that I also think is, is interesting about the style is that historically most pumpkin beers are just some sort of amber ale that's not hopped very heavily that's spiced with pumpkin spices but today we've seen breweries do a lot of and I, and I agree with the comment here that it's like it's a category it's not a style um if you look at it in like a competition type setting um you know you're gonna have when if somebody enters in like a pumpkin spice or a fruit spice vegetable or spice or vegetable type of category, or I can't remember, I think it's field beers in, in GABF. Um, they're going to have to indicate a base style. And like I said, a lot of the traditional examples of people making pumpkin beers would be some sort of kind of like amber ale, not very hoppy base. But today we have people doing all sorts of interesting things with, pumpkin and pumpkin spices in beer. So in addition to that sort of standard, you'll see people making pumpkin spice porters or pumpkin spice stouts. Uh, one sort of extreme example that I could think of was uh, Avery Brewing out in Colorado, Colorado makes a beer called uh, Rumpkin that is a rum barrel aged pumpkin beer that clocks in at like 16 and a half percent alcohol. Um, look at breweries like Allagash and Jolly Pumpkin. Uh, Allagash makes a beer called Ghoul Ship. Jolly Pumpkin makes a beer called La Parcella that are mixed culture beers made with pumpkin. And so those beers are going to have some amount of acidity and, and funky character to them. They definitely stray outside of what you'd think of as a traditional pumpkin beer. So at this point, uh, pumpkin beer... Well, I still would generally say that most people's idea of pumpkin beer is the sort of amber pumpkin spice thing. Brewers are doing all sorts of interesting stuff with pumpkins in beer. And, uh, and you know, that makes it more fun and exciting. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how pumpkin beer is made and what the ingredients are. So 
from a grist perspective, it's, it's going to depend on what the base style is, obviously. I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of sort of that standard amber ale beer that a lot of pumpkin beers sort of conform to. So the grist usually going to be like a pale malt base with some malts for color and, and malt flavor, probably a lot of like recipes that I've seen include some amount of Munich malt, um, some type of crystal malt would be pretty common. Uh, and that would kind of give you that amber color and, and a little bit more like toast and caramel malt flavor to the beer. As I mentioned earlier, like pumpkin shows up in a lot of these beers because they're called pumpkin beers, but like it's not by any means a required ingredient. And there are plenty of breweries that go without the pumpkin since it doesn't really provide much in the way of flavor. Uh, breweries that do use the pumpkin, there are a number of different ways that it can be used. A lot of breweries will first roast the pumpkin not, I've, I've heard some people talk about it as, as being a step done to develop flavor, but in truth, it does not develop that much flavor. What it's more about is that it gelatinizes the starches so that they can be broken down during mashing. So in a lot of cases, breweries will either use pumpkin puree or will roast the pumpkin and mash it into a puree and then add it to the mash um, and then at that point, the, you know, the malt enzymes present are going to be able to convert those pumpkin starches into simple fermentable sugars. Um, so, and there are other ways that it can be used, but that's, I would say is probably the most common way that it is added a really large scale production of these beers. They're probably using pumpkin puree, but, um, smaller producers would probably roast and then mash the, the pumpkin. Um, hops in this style are typically pretty minimal. So variety doesn't usually matter that much. Oftentimes it's going to be low levels of American or English hops used just to add enough bitterness to balance any sweetness present. Uh, yeast similarly doesn't provide a ton of character from what I could find. A lot of breweries will use either an American ale yeast or an English ale yeast. Um, yeast character, I would say, doesn't necessarily stand out above the spice character in these beers. So you're not usually looking at a super characterful fermentation flavor profile. The driving force behind these styles is the, the spice profile uh, or the spices that are added. And once again, uh, spices commonly used for these beers are going to be things like cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, allspice, and ginger. This one that I am drinking is made with sweet potatoes and then cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, allspice, and cloves. So all five of those kind of very traditional pumpkin pie spice spices. When we talk about the flavor of this beer, uh, in a lot of cases it is in, in, in the better made examples of the style, it is a balance between spice character and malt character. So you have sort of that, at this point, very familiar Hobby Lobby uh, pumpkin spice candle aroma profile of kind of that blend of cinnamon and ginger and nutmeg. Um, and in some cases, I've definitely found like it can just be like crazy, assertive, high levels of, of spices. Um, in other cases, like it can be well integrated with some kind of caramel, toasty, maybe brown sugar, like malt flavors. Uh, and, you know, when you put all that together, it can be sort of reminiscent of like a, like a candied yams or sweet potato casserole sort of thanksgiving side dish um and that is sort of the uh, as as far as i know that's kind of the general impression that people are usually going after with this style of beer not going to talk about closely related styles because i don't know that there's anything that i'd really pick to to put this up against um and when you talk about pairing, Avery and I sat here and talked about pairing for a little while before this got started. 
most of our ideas were just silly. Um, though when she tasted it, she said that she thought it there was a possibility that it could be good with like a grilled steak with like a chimichurri sauce, just kind of like the herbal elements playing off of some of the spice elements in, in the beer. Um, it was like, you know, everything else we threw out was like, pair it with Thanksgiving or bacon or turkey. Like in a lot of cases, people would generally think to go after something kind of like matchy, matchy, which I, I will admit I have not tried. I am not a regular pumpkin beer consumer, um, but I wouldn't necessarily want to pit this up against like a Thanksgiving dinner. I think it would be just too much of the same. Um, and in virtually all cases of pairing with some sort of non-dessert thing, I feel like you could almost always find a better beer than a pumpkin beer. Um, there are definitely some cases where I think certain desserts could work well with it. Um, uh, particularly, you know, you think about, there's a reason why pumpkin spice lattes are, are so popular. Like the spice character pairs well with vanilla and kind of like cream dairy sorts of characteristics. So, uh, you know, something like vanilla ice cream or even making like a pumpkin beer vanilla ice cream float, uh, creme brulee could work really well. I think I also, a lot of times when I think about building pairings, I like to think about familiar flavor combinations and what could work. So, you know, one of the things I always think of when I'm thinking about desserts is like, okay, if I'm going to pair with chocolate, what are people putting in like really exciting artisanal chocolate bars? Like I can think of chocolate with chilies or chocolate with orange peel. I can definitely think of chocolate made with like, uh, like crystallized ginger and cinnamon. So not saying that you want to put that chocolate with this beer, but that if you take something that is more focused on just uh, pure expression of chocolate and pit it against this beer, you might be able to create that impression of sort of a, uh, like a chocolate bar with crystallized ginger and cinnamon. Um, and so that's, that's the, where my brain usually goes. Um, one thing though, with a dessert pairing with one of these is that, um, Sometimes these beers can be kind of dry, especially if they're actually made with sweet potato or pumpkin because it provides a lot of fermentable sugar and, and not much else. It's you know similar to if you were to boost the alcohol content of a beer using corn or rice or just simple sugar. Um, so the beers can sometimes end up actually being kind of dry. And in a dessert pairing setting, when you pair something really sweet with a beer that's kind of dry, it can make the beer seem really almost unpleasantly dry it like it accentuates the fact that there is no sweetness present so for a good dessert pairing to work you'd want to be using a pumpkin beer that was that at least had a little bit of residual sweetness to it um that's at least my thought uh like i said i haven't i pairing is one of those things where like you learn what works when you when you actually test stuff out and you pair beers with different dishes. And admittedly, I have not done a lot of exploration of pairing pumpkin beers and food together. So I'm sorry that I cannot offer the uh, firsthand experience on that front. But uh, those are at least my ideas on a few things that might work or might be interesting. So I think that's the majority of what I have to say. And there are just a couple questions in here, but I will take them and see. And one of these sort of already got existed or already got addressed. And that was that if pumpkin ale existed for so long. and is now an established style in the U.S. Why doesn't the BJCP mention it in the style guidelines? Um, and it, it is covered even somewhat explicitly. So in the old BJCP guidelines, beers like this would have just been entered in the specialty cat category of uh, spicer vegetable beers. Um, 
Today, within the Spicer vegetable beers category, they also have subcategories for, I think it's uh, autumn seasonal, and I think they also have a winter seasonal category as well. But that autumn seasonal sort of covers these, excuse me, these sorts of beers. If you go, I think it's category 30. Um, so it falls into those specialty types of beers. And, and part of the reasoning behind that is that uh, well, I would argue that this sort of amber-ish beer, this amber ale, not too hoppy thing is sort of the standard for pumpkin beer. What they are doing by making it a special specialty category is they're recognizing the fact that uh, people will produce this beer using any number of different types of bases to make it and making it a special category specialty category allows people to enter it in that way. It's important to remember, um, you know, we lean on the style guidelines heavily as uh, an educational tool, a tool to teach people about the styles of beer that are out there, but that's not really their purpose. They work really well for that. And even in their release of the 2015 guidelines, like BJCP kind of acknowledged that like, People use these for education and for other sorts of things, and they work well for that. But first and foremost, the guidelines are designed to allow people to judge beer competitions. They're designed to give people standards against which to judge beers. And so in some cases, what is or is not a category is primarily dictated by what sorts of beers people are entering into competitions. And new styles will often pop up if one of these specialty categories is seeing tons and tons and tons of entries, so much so that it doesn't make sense to judge, uh, you know, this is the thing with like hazy IPA, like it, it doesn't make sense to judge hazy IPAs against somebody's like Britannomyces Imperial Stout with cherries in it that was being entered in experimental beer because at the time there wasn't another place to put hazy IPA. Um, so that eventually got its own style, removing all of those from one of those more experimental categories. Uh, I would imagine that the reason why there isn't a more prominent pumpkin spice category than there is, is because the way it's currently structured adequately handles the number of pumpkin spice entries that you see in, in various competitions. So um, there is a specialty category that exists for it, but it's not as segmented out because there's not as, there just aren't enough e tr examples of like a well-defined single style. Ken wanted to know, um, from a Cicerone standpoint, how are autumn or winter seasonal, seasonal beers part of the exams? Uh, certified Cicerone level, I would say they're not, they don't really, they don't play in there. We, the closest we get to like specialty styles at the certified Cicerone level is talking about like the general flavors you might expect from something like a beer fermented with Britannomyces. Um, but you know, we don't dig too heavily into these types of beers at that level. The advanced and master level, um, you know, we do ask questions about some of these broader categories of styles. And in that case, it would usually be a case where you'd be asked to, there are a few different ways that we might ask about it. You could be asked to describe how these beers might be brewed. So how would people go about using some of these ingredients, whether that's spices or uh, starchy adjunct like uh, pumpkin. Um, you might be asked in a question just to identify commercial examples of beer that are made with spices or some interesting fermentable or, you know, that fit into one of those categories. Uh, so identify commercial examples and describe them. Talk about the, the flavors of, of those specific commercial examples. That's another way that that information might be tested in those upper level exams. Um, you wouldn't probably get a super 
focused question just on like pumpkin beer, but you never know. You never know. But, uh, but I would say probably not. Um, and then also at the certified Cicerone level, these beers would not show up on the tasting exam. Advanced and master level definitely could. Um, on both the advanced and master tasting exams, there are what we refer to as descriptive panels. They have different stipulations. Sometimes you'll be asked to give like a set of five flavor descriptors that encapsulate the profile of a beer, sometimes asked to write a shelf talker for a beer or to write a full technical description of a beer. Um, at those levels for those panels, we'll put just about anything on them. You know, beers made with spices, with fruit, with smoked malts that have been fermented with mixed culture, that have been barrel aged with weird agent, like anything goes in those panels. So these sorts of beers could absolutely show up on that portion of a tasting exam. It, this would never show up in like a style panel. We're, we're never going to put this beer in front of you and be like, is this a, a pumpkin spice beer or an amber ale? Uh, one, because that would be super easy. And two, because once again, those specialty categories aren't really well defined around uh, like a single identity of a, of a style. So um, so yeah, hopefully that sort of fleshes out or, or gives a good explanation of what you would expect to see on one of our exams as it pertains to, to one of these beers. I, I, I certainly did not pick this beer uh, for, for those of you out there that are using this session to study for the exams. Hopefully you still picked up some interesting stuff when it comes to like use of spices and, and different sorts of adjuncts in beers. I did not pick this beer because I'm like, this beer is super relevant for our exams. Like it's, we've covered a lot of ground over the last several months talking about a lot of different styles of beer. Um, and, you know, I thought it'd be, I, I personally wanted to dig in a little bit on the history of this, uh, of this style and learn a little bit more about, learn a little bit more about it. So that's, that's why I picked this one. Let's see. So Edwin asked a very general question on what's the best way to study and get the most out of certi Cicerone certification studying and preparation during these times. Wow, that's a, that's a can of worms right there. Um, you know, I would say that... Uh, one of the things that people struggle with the most on, on our exams, this is across the board, all levels uh, of the program, is style knowledge. Style knowledge is the, let's see. And Tom just asked, when you research a style of beer, do you have some go-to sources? Sure, I'll talk about them in, in this section. That, that is perfect. Um, style knowledge is one of the things that people struggle with the most, and that is I think because there's just so, there's a lot of information. There are a lot of different beer styles. There's a lot to know about them. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that people I think have the most trouble with. Um, when I was first learning about beer about a decade ago now, um, I was super fortunate that I, weaseled my way into a BJCP class geared at preparing people to be BJCP judges, which I was also doing at the time. Um, and it was a group of 12 or so of us. We got together uh, once a week and would meet for about four hours once a week for like 12 weeks. So it was like 6.30 to 10.30 PM on Thursdays for three months. And what we did is we went through all of the BJCP guidelines. Basically, we take 10 styles or so per session. Um, one or two people would be responsible for purchasing the beer for that week. And we'd get two commercial examples of every single style. And what we do is we taste through them as a group with the style guidelines in front of us, read through the guidelines, and then talk about the beer and how well we thought it conformed to the guidelines um, talk about whether or not we felt like it was outside of the style. Um, just having that experience of tasting so many commercial examples with the style guidelines in front of you, having kind of a constructive 
discussion of, about whether or not it fit the guidelines. That's the foundation of my style knowledge. Like I learned and internalized so much about beer styles in that three month period that um, when I took the certified system exam, like six months after that, I almost aced the styles portion. Um, and I didn't have to do that much more preparation for styles. That was such incredible preparation for it. So you can't necessarily get together with a group of people right now and do that, which is unfortunate. But even just doing that exercise on your own of trying to purchase, and, and once again, like, you know, doing it with that amount of time investment, we covered a lot of ground in a relatively short amount of time. You could set out to do this over the course of a year um, or even two years, but just like pick, if you picked, depending upon how much time you have to dedicate to it, couple styles a week, or maybe like three or four styles a week, um, go out and try to find a couple commercial examples of each of those styles, read the guidelines while you taste those styles and think about whether or not they're kind of meshing with, with what it is that you're picking up in these beers it can be a really awesome way to, uh, to learn about and internalize style information. And yeah, I don't know. There, there are a lot of different things you could do to study um, while you are working towards getting certification. Um, if styles is what you want to cover, I think that that's one of the best and, and simplest exercises that you can do. So to go back and talk about what I usually, what are my go-to resources when I do style stuff? When I prep these talks, I have sort of a set, uh, set topics that I want to hit. I want to hit history. I want to hit brewing process. I want to hit flavor profile. I want to hit the styles that I can compare it against. And I want to hit pairing stuff. And if you kind of like break it down like that and make sure that you're gathering those pieces of information for every style, you'll leave with a really robust understanding of, of each style that you study in that way. When I'm consulting resources for these styles, um, first and first resource I go to is always BJCP. BJCP is such a well, the BJCP guidelines is such a well-researched and put together document. It is a phenomenal place to get information on flavor profile, ingredients commonly used for, uh, to brew the style, um, history tidbits, styles that are you can commonly compare it against, and commercial examples. I don't have a space in here for commercial examples, but if you're studying for exams, commercial examples are super important to cover. The reason I don't have a space in here for commercial examples is because I have just like, I've focused on commercial examples over the course of the time I've spent studying beer. They're just drilled into my brain. I don't need to write them down at this point. Like, you know, you want to talk about pumpkin beer. I can think of like five or six pumpkin beers off the top of my head that I wish I'd been able to find for this. This one is delightful, but I, it, it I was not able to find one of the more widely available ones, but um, yeah, BJCP is the first reference that I typically go to. I often will refer back to the Road to Cicerone books that we've written. Uh, we did a lot of research into putting those books together. And so when I need to jog my memory on, on what we researched about those, I will go back to those sources because they can be a, a super helpful resource for beer styles. Um, Oxford Companion to Beer, I'll usually dig into to pull some information together. Um, and then it kind of depends for different portions. Like if I'm like, oh, I want to look at a little bit more at what, uh, at recipes of the style. I'll either Google recipes because you can usually find some on websites like BYO, Brew Your Own, might have a few homebrewing recipes. Um, I also have resources like uh, you know Ray's Designing Great Beers and Jamil Zanishef's uh, Brewing Classic Styles. Um, I don't consult those as much as I used to, but those are really good resources for getting a better idea for the way that these different recipes can be formulated. 
Um, I'm trying to think what else I consult regularly. Uh, Garrett Oliver's Brewmaster's Table is really good for beer and food pairing. Um, you know, that's a book that it, it very much is his sort of anecdotal experience with, with beer and food pairing. And I don't always, I, the, there's definitely stuff outside of what he writes about that can make, uh, make for great pairings with different beers, but he has such a romantic way of, of describing pairings, um, that I'll usually do a little bit of thinking on what I would like to pair. Um, and then I'll go dig into that book and it just adds uh, additional ins inspiration. Um, it's, uh, Garrett Oliver's Brewmaster's Table is, it's kind of like, it's a lot of people's entry point into learning about how, how beer and food pairing is done. And it's not a mechanics book. It's not a like, you should put this with this and it works because of this. It's more just, he's like, he catalogs some good commercial examples of various styles of beer. Um, and then he talks about things that he likes to pair with them. And he, I think, has such an engaging way of writing about beer and food pairing. Um, I first read this book, I think, in 2010. And uh, I've been revisiting it a lot as I've been doing these sessions, like I said, kind of to just jog additional inspiration. And every time I open it and like read a few pages, I'm like, I really need to sit down and reread this. Like, it's such a, it's just an inspiring book. Like, I, I love the way he writes about beer and food pairing. It just makes me like, it makes me hungry and it makes me want to pair stuff. It's, it's awesome. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm trying to think. Let's see. Hopefully that sort of covers uh, different style resources. I didn't mention in there um, Randy Mosier's Tasting Beer. I don't often find myself going back to that one because it's more of an introductory text. It covers a lot of ground at a pretty, um, it, it goes into some depth, but it's not like most of the, most of the stuff that is in tasting beer, I have internalized at this point, so I don't have to use it as a reference very often. If you have not read tasting beer, like if somebody was like, I want to learn more about beer, could you recommend me a book? And they just wanted one book, that is the book. Like that is, if you have not read tasting beer by Randy Mosher, do yourself a favor, buy it, read it. Like hands down, that's the book. So like I said, I don't necessarily use it when I'm trying to pull these sessions together at this point, but that's because um, uh, because I've internalized most of the stuff that's in there. Um, let's see. Michael asked, in regard to side-by-side -side commercial tastings, does current level of brewing make it harder to find off-guideline versions of a style? Um, I'm wondering if you mean just because like a lot of stuff is like adjuncted or variations on a style. Um, and if that is what you mean, then yes, it is at this point. It can be hard to find classic versions of some styles. Um, that, and, and, you know, if you can't find a classic version of a style in your area, like that's fine. I would say skip over it. For, for the time being, um, I do think it's still worthwhile. Like, honestly, from my perspective, like, I think it's just exciting seeking out some of these beers um, and, and getting to try them because each and every style, as you guys, as anyone who's participated in this a lot has seen, uh, every style has its own history. Every style, like, represents... Um, you know, pieces of a time and a place where, where that style came into being. I feel like when you drink it, it, almost more so with some of the less accessible, more esoteric styles, 
when you try those styles, like you're drinking a piece of somebody's culture, which I think is so cool and, and so much fun. Um, last fall, I was out in Nuremberg, Germany for Brau, which is a big uh, international brewing conference. And I had read about prior to being there, uh, this style that the Brewers Association recently added to their guidelines called Franconian style rote beer, which means red beer. So it's this red lager that is indigenous to Franconia. Um, primarily today, it's only found in Nuremberg. Um, and while we were there, we like got together a group of some of us and, and a, a friend of mine took us out to this like tiny local brewery there where they had their rope beer. And like, we got to try that. It was such a cool experience getting to like try this style that was so important to the local people there and, you know, represented to them like uh, part of their place in the world of brewing. I think that's so awesome. So, uh, so yeah, some of these styles can be really challenging to find. Um, and, uh, but I would argue that that doesn't mean that they're not relevant um, because some of my favorite beer drinking experiences that I've had are with some of those styles of beer that aren't as widely available. So, you know, I, it, it also, it's a different kind of beer tourism. I feel like a lot of what I see of beer tourism today is like, who has, who has big lines, who's releasing the most exciting pastry stout or like the most in your face New England IPA, like, I want to know where I can find a classic English mild. Like, you know, my, one of my all time favorite breweries in the U S is Hogshead in Denver because they produce really classic and, and well taken care of examples of English cask beer, which is so hard to come by in the U S. So like every time I'm in Denver, I try to go there because it's one of the only places I can go without you know, without going across an ocean that I can try those styles of beer. So that's just my take. All right. And then it looks like we have two other questions that are about when we might do stuff again <laughs> um, that I can try to take. One is update on Road to Cicerone food pairing book. Um, we are sort of slowly working on that. That is a little bit on pause as we've been developing some of this online e-learning content. And it's possible, though I don't know, but it's possible that we might put together a pairing course in that format before we address it in a book format. Um, but TBD on that. And then uh, Mark asked about when we'll be doing the tasting portion of the certified exams again. I am definitely not the person to answer that. That's in uh, our exam director, Chris Pisney's hands. Um, it's something that we are actively exploring. Uh, we're trying to figure out a way to do it safely, obviously. First and foremost, we want uh, both the people administering the test and the people taking the test to feel safe. Uh, the last thing in the world we want is any exam candidates to, you know, get sick while they're coming to take one of our exams. So uh, the last I heard, I think we are exploring the possibility of being able to give small tasting exams uh, out of our Chicago offices. That's where we would start. And then we'd see if we were able to roll it out to other locations um, that probably at the earliest, that probably would start in early 2021, but I'm not hundred percent sure on that. Um, certainly don't hold, hold me to the early 2021. Um, I just, I don't think that it will happen this year. So, uh, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we've tried to figure out how to do remote tasting just from like a teaching perspective, because it's, it can be really hard to teach about beer and tasting 
at a distance. Uh, not exactly sure how we do it in a testing capacity, but if anybody has like a really stellar idea, we're all ears. So, um, well, I didn't get to answer a lot of questions on pumpkin beer, which is fine by me because I didn't necessarily have a lot more to say about it, but hopefully all of that extra info on just general Cicerone related stuff was interesting or useful to you, you guys. Um, looking forward to final three weeks of this. Hopefully you guys are, join us next week to talk with Neil about California Common. I imagine a lot of people will be drinking Anchor Steam. Um, and then uh, start thinking about what you want to drink on the 18th. I know I am, I am starting to do the same thing. So, so until next time, uh, enjoy a beer, and I'll see you guys soon.